Awesome. Okay. Um, well, again, I reiterate, thank you guys so much for hopping on today. Um, this is the first meetup group, I think, for 2024. So um, no pressure here um, on my side, but glad everyone can join. Um, so we're going to be talking through um, discovering your niche, um, essentially your, your professional print. Um, so here's an overview of what I've got planned to just discuss this evening. So we're going to talk through what is a niche, defining and zeroing in on that. Um, a fit analysis, which is a, a level, a four level analysis that I use to kind of almost do a, an integrity check of my skills and kind of where I'm at in, in, uh, in the space. And then uh, we'll talk through an industry or real time experience. I had the pleasure of interviewing um, my colleague who's got 30 years in the business and networking in particular. And so I thought it'd be really good to kind of share some of um, that knowledge. And then we'll um, follow up on some tips and suggestions that um, I've worked in uh, this far and, and open up for Q&A. So um, before I get started, I just want to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I was asked to present tonight um, as I'm not an expert in the field, but I would be considered a peer to all of you, um, given that I'm also new uh, to cybersecurity, but I bring a very unique perspective. I'm here to share with you what I'm currently doing to narrow down my own niche in real time, um, and then what's worked for me thus far, and share a bit of insight of what I've experienced in the time that I've been in cybersecurity, which is very short. Um, and, uh, and also my journey. So it's a very unique one. So a little bit about me. I'm currently an IT security analyst for a small mid-sized privately held company here in Melbourne. We specialize in bad debts for hospital and healthcare centers. Um, I am the solo IT security analyst reporting directly to an InfoSec director. I am the number two. I have four peers on my team, a network engineer and three system administrators. And uh, I'm essentially responsible for the security of over 500 users in four, four different call centers. Um, and we're in a 100% on-prem environment. So I uh, hopes to change that. Um, but my background before getting into cybersecurity was that I was a former executive headhunter and uh, talent acquisition manager uh, and project manager for over nine years. So I specialized in third-party recruiting. So I worked for um, large firms that would hire my firm to give them the top of talent. And, um, and then earlier on, I started in social services and then transitioned into recruiting. And so I don't have any IT certifications. Um, I don't have an IT degree. I do have an MBA um, in business, global business, and an undergrad in family psychology. So nothing that would be really relevant to um, tonight's culinary in the niche, but I wanted to share a little bit about my background. It's, it's been a unique journey for me to, to get into cybersecurity. So this is just a quick snapshot. In June of 2022, um, I started heavily doing research in the field of cybersecurity. Um, I wanted to narrow down my niche, ironically, um, in recruiting to actually become a cybersecurity recruiter. I was a generalist, so it means I covered any kind of role in any industry in any vertical. So I had a wealth of knowledge, but I didn't have a niche. Um, and so I think having that skill set and understanding that is also why I've been able to uh, feel very strongly about tonight's presentation and tonight's call about the impacts of really defining what that niche is for you, especially here in cybersecurity. Um, and so actually, I was looking to build out a book of business um, with my own um, firm or my own clients that were looking to hire cybersecurity professionals. And so at the time, I was working two roles. I contracted on the side doing freelance work, um, just small IT projects with a client of mine that was like, yeah, um, if you're interested in learning more technical stuff, just to be dangerous when you're recruiting it, yeah, my IT people need help. And I'm like, okay. And I had zero understanding of what, what was going on. Earlier in my lifetime, I my undergrad and probably five or six years before that, I was doing like small technician stuff for like my elderly neighbors, like plugging in printers and showing them how to work an iPhone. So, but I had no experience working like full on uh, IT work um, around AD or just your typical tier one tech support stuff. I had zero knowledge of that. Um, so very low level support there. Um, so I started to build a business case to recruit in cybersecurity. We flash forward to um, 2022, uh, November. I actually was creating a pitch to de develop to my vice president at the time and say, hey, we really need to target this market because I actually saw the skills and the gap that we need to hire professionals back then. 
Um, immediately in the begin once I began to unroll this, um, my pitch was turned down and I had a decision to make. I was very passionate about the space I had no idea about. Um, so I picked up my CompTIA Sec Plus book and I just started reading it. Um, so then flash forward to uh, about Q1, uh, March of, uh, tail end of March of 2023, um, I was told the direction of the business would be going and I was out of a job. At the time I was completing the last semester of my MBA. I had a barely working understanding of what cybersecurity was. I was flipping through um, the Google cert online. At the time it wasn't even open until I think until May. So I was just going down Coursera and all these rabbit holes. Because I was like, what am I going to do? I am out of a job. I'm in the middle of my MBA and I have zero tech skills. So I attended my first CyberSec meetup group. So it's come full circle to be here tonight to be able to present. Um, and then what I did between that March and June time or May time was really just finish on my MBA and, and uh, suck at life. I was really down. Didn't know what I was going to do. So on the night of my graduation, I revamped my resume and I put it out. And I don't know if the cosmos and the stars aligned, but four weeks later, I landed my position that I'm currently in now. Um, and so why I wanted to share that is I applied for everything under the moon um, because I just wanted to get into tech. I just knew that I needed to be here. I didn't know why. I understood cybersecurity at a very basic level. I didn't understand the components, the niches, the specialties. I wasn't even that close to it. I was just still trying to figure out how to get into it. And so um, from that end, as I was studying for CompTIA, I was like, well, what am I doing this for? When I landed my role as an IT security analyst, I actually applied for my role to be just a general tech support, bare bones, sysadmin. And because I had put that I was studying for my CompTIA um, Sec Plus, my, my now boss said, hey, would you be interested in an IT security analyst while we're thinking about really developing um, this role? And we've had a, a tech that's worked in security before they've left, but um, would you consider it? And I jumped at the bit. I didn't care how much money it was making. I just was like, yeah, I didn't know. Flash forward till today and I am, I've closed at least six initiatives. Um, I'm in my second audit. I've uh, completed a SOC 2 audit, led that initiative and completed, um, completed that with in good standing in November. Um, conducted three more initiatives in between that, and we are already spearheading for 2025. And it has been a very, very quick ramp up time. And, and I'm touching multiple different um, hats uh, a day. So it's very, uh, very crazy, but very grateful to be in this position. So again, I just wanted to share a bit about my timeline and my journey um, and give a real time example of how your journey is unique to you. It is essential to narrow down your focus. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have been able to land my role at a time um, that I did. And it has opened my eyes to all different kinds of specialties within the space. Um, and defining your niche for yourself is essential, not only for road mapping your career, um, but also for not overwhelming yourself as you enter into this field or continue into this field. So from that end, what we talk about when we think about defining your niche, what do we really mean by that? Um, and as it's defined, it's, I did a simple Google search, but from Oxford languages, a comfortable or suitable position in life or employment. Essentially, it's a specialized segment of the market, a particular kind of product or service. Well, essentially what I think of it here and how it applies to us tonight is what area of cybersecurity are you wanting to specialize in? And that can mean multiple different answers. That could be what skill set do you want to attain? Because that's a niche. Um, what staff do you want to work with? What, um, what kind of role do you want to be in? Do you want to be in a, in a leadership role? Do you want to be in just an individual contributor role? Do you want to just be an engineer? Do you want to be an analyst? There's different areas of what this looks like. Um, and the way that I think of it is a passion forward framework. Like what do you, what, what gets your, your clock ticking um, enough for you to build your career on or at least the next five years? Cause it can change no matter what that looks like. Um, and so why I thought, why is it relevant though to have a niche? Um, and so I wanted to give some stats here because uh, I'm, I'm a really big on, on data that makes sense and also having an understanding of why we do the things that we do. So why is having a niche in cybersecurity really relevant right now? And why is there a sense of urgency behind it? Well, because there's 3.4 million professionals um, that are needed right now. And this is as of 2023. All of the stats that I pulled tonight, I pulled from a workforce study for 2023 from ISC2. So I got it from the source's mouth. Um, so that is the gap right now of the amount of cybersecurity professionals needed in the market. And that was just, again, 2023. Um, from that side, uh, ongoing education and training is the number one 
mitigator for shrinking the skills gap. So 58% of cybersecurity professionals said that negative impact of worker shortages can be mitigated by filling skills gaps. They found that those who continue their training and education, upscaling, certification reimbursement programs, were better prepared to weather the times of economic uncertainty. Um, organizations with layoffs who kept these programs were less likely to experience significant gaps. Um, and professionals have felt that continuing that education and essentially, in this case, narrowing down a niche, so to speak, really has helped continue to shrink that gap. Um, additionally, cybersecurity workforce in the gap have grown and they continue to grow in every year. Um, so in 2023, the cybersecurity workforce has grown 8.7%, um, but the gap between the numbers of workers between the numbers of workers and uh, the available skills continue to grow. So there's a 12.6 increase year over year uh, currently um, of that gap still. And from a niche market, right? So we understand that there's a, a need. We understand we need to narrow down our focus, but what niches are working? What are What is the market telling us that's like the biggest gap if we're looking at it from a practical standpoint? Um, and then how do we begin to narrow that down? So my, my role in looking at that for myself was like, well, what's the market telling me? Look at the skills and the gaps in the markets. So 92% of organizations report having skills gaps in their organizations, and the most common being cloud computing, um, AI and machine learning that we were talking about earlier, and zero trust implementation. Um, out of that 92%, 67% said that both shortages in total staff and skills gap, the biggest challenge between the two of those was the actual skills gap that are often the worst problem. And so from that, um, professionals we face like an, an unprecedented threat landscape currently. Um, we within, I think I wanna say probably within the last five years, according to this stat, um, that we have the most threatening landscape for cybersecurity we've ever had before uh, for, for attacks and threats in general. And so what that means to me, or at least when I'm reading and I see that about, okay, if I'm gonna narrow down a niche, what kind of impact can it have? Well, it's clear that the sense of urgency is there and the need to narrow down your focus and build your skills is almost um, paramount to closing the gap of what we need as professionals. And so 52% of organizations believe that they do have the tools and the people needed to respond to these cyber threats um, over the next two to three years. But with the shortages and the skills gaps, there's far more um, that needs to be done for organizations to feel secure. So in hindsight, the tools are in place, potentially the people at the organizations are in place, or the opportunity to bring on new people with that skill is in place. Um, but the actual skills themselves to mitigate the threat in real time is missing. So as I mentioned above, the shortage in skill can be mitigated through continuing education. So when you're narrowing down your niche, what are we looking at? Um, essentially, are we looking at cert stacking? Are we looking at developing your home labs? Are we looking at raising your hand at your current work environment if you are working in tech? Or are we looking at networking and just simply having um, a better understanding of what of what of where your need could lie within the space? And that's just coming from a practical side. Um, but all that to say, the sense of urgency in narrowing down your niche is essential. Um, so with that, then what's the solution, right? I'm one person, what am I gonna do with that? Um, or better yet, how do you even start narrowing down your niche if you really wanted to? Um, just so that you can feel like you're contributing to this profession. Well, you can start by understanding that whatever you do, even if you are one person, you're closing the gap. So build a skill set that narrows down the need. So for instance, if you are in the red team and offensive is your jam and your preference, see what skills are needed to get yourself closer to it. Uh, what tech stacks are being used for that? What um, What's the common tools or uh, that are being used within that specific niche? Uh, if you're a pen tester, vulnerability tester, kind of look at CloudSec. Are you looking at Azure? Are you looking at AWS? What, what are your skills lying from that? Um, and then if you're working in AppSec side, it is about what language is better for you to learn um, or to start off with and to incorporate, you know, or discover the latest issues with that. And then move to targeting your audience. So if you have zero clue of where to start, know or at least have an idea of who you want to target when you do have a niche, right? So is that potentially the next role? Is it your hiring manager currently? Is it your boss currently? Is it your teacher? Is it, you know, another professional or whoever it is? Know who your target audience would be once you understand what your niche is going to be. And that's a very different lens to find out, but 
what kind of impact do you want to have from that? Um, and then what kind of rooms do you want to be in when you find out what that is? Um, are you wanting to be at the hackathons? Are you wanting to get paid for the, bu the, the bug bounties? Great. What are you doing to get there? Um, and then third, uh, sorry about that. Uh, third is to consider your cost of your niche. Um, and by cost, when I was in recruiting, I always pitched compensation as being, or how much money you make, being two different goals, the intrinsic and the extrinsic. The intrinsic was the value add that you felt by doing the job, um, and the value add that you brought to the team, and the value add that you could do to make an impact um, and really shift or, and move some things here at this current organization. The other being monetary. Um, so consider the cost for you. When you are narrowing down your niche, consider what your absolutes are and what are your nice to haves. When you look at a job description, there's always an absolute and nice to have. When you're in a conversation and they say, we in it with a client and you're consulting, and let's say they're trying to build out their infrastructure. Well, tell me what, you know, what your landscape is currently, or what are your absolutes? What are your nice to haves? What do you have with, with teams? Like just conversation, but consider your cost. Um, evaluate if more time with your family is an absolute for you and, and for you to do your best work, then maybe a 24 hour op shop is probably not something you can, can swing. Or if it is, have the conversation. So what is that cost going to look for you? And if you want it to narrow down that, it can be the intrinsic and the extrinsic. Extrinsic being the money, the money, power, respect, however you want to look at it. Um, or it could just be moving into a different level in life for you. And then intrinsic is what's the impact or what do you want to do once you narrow down your niche? What's this, when you gain the skills to do so, what is it that you want to do with that? And then fourth, I would consider really think about your the easy to difficult ratio. And what I mean by that is define how complex once you narrow down your niche or have an idea of where you want to go, how complex is learning that upscale, right? So how or narrowing down that focus to attain the information that you need to be succeeded, but to succeed within that niche. So define what that is, define the complexity. Is it going to take you? And that's essentially what we think of in road mapping, right? So if you are in school right now and you're mapping out with two or three projects and those seem to be, I want to say easy for you, but you're like, yeah, that's cool. I want to do it to get the A, but here's what I really want to get into. Okay, great. How complex or how difficult would it be for you to do both at the same time so you can optimize your time? Or if time is not your currency and you're looking at it from a skill set and wanting to understand how long would that actually take you given all of the things that you're doing currently. And so really evaluate that easy to difficult ratio. For instance, when I first started in a cyber or once obviously uh, first started in cybersecurity, I had no, I'm still, I narrowed it down, but I thought, oh, I would go into computer forensics or I wouldn't go work for the FBI. In hindsight, that's not going to work. Like I, it's much more difficult for me to, to see the mapping of that. And so I had to really weigh outweigh what that was. Um, so that's just a small example from it. But having a solution is great. But if you're like myself, where you're like, that's fantastic. Again, you'll hear me continuously say, what am I going to do if I still don't even have a clue? Well, I conducted a fit analysis, which essentially um, is to figure out where you fit currently, because you have everything you need right now, which is the opportunity to look at some things, um, the motivation to do it, and the capacity to achieve as much success as you possibly can with all that you want to do with it. And so from that side, be realistic about where you fit right now. And so I created this fit analysis and I broke it down into four levels. And I did so based on my experience as a candidate searching uh, like for my first cybersecurity job and even currently now. Um, just thinking about like what's out there, what, where do I fit in the market? Um, and also I leveraged my experience working as an executive headhunter in TA and how I used to categorize types of candidates that I used to pitch to hiring managers based on what value add I thought they could bring to the table for the role that I was working with. Not many recruiters do that. So I was one off on it, but generally I have found I can kind of group candidates to fall in one of these areas. So your level ones, these aren't necessarily your entry level folks, but they could be. You're either fresh in or fresh out of school, or you have 15 years experience in another profession and decided to make a career change or nine years like myself um, with limited transferable skills in tech or in cybersecurity in general. So what do you do with that? You're completely brand new. You have no idea where to start um, or you have been working in tech. And maybe you've been working as an IT help desk, you kind of understand a little bit on cybersecurity, but now you're like, well, this seems really cool. And you're new to it. You have no skill in that. 
Um, and this all varies. You can be a level one in a skill and like a level four in, in the years of experience. It really just opens and depends on the person. Um, and then you have your level twos. I would consider these folks the zero in level. These are the, you may be working in tech, you may um, are in school currently and you've got a, a year or two years, maybe five, maybe six years experience. Um, and then you're moving in, zeroing in into your niche. Uh, maybe you already have had one or maybe you're you're narrowing into another one um, that you want to pursue. And so you have a strong skill set in one area for many years, but a little limited on the others. And again, it varies. You could be a level two um, on certain tools and maybe a level three on other things. So again, it varies. And then there's the level threes. Um, they're the, what I call the trade level. So for me, technology in and of itself, um, and then I will I will narrow that down to cybersecurity. I feel it as a trade. I think it's a skill set that can carry me no matter where I go. Um, I think for technology in and of itself, when you're narrowing down to working in this kind of capacity, you are already in a niche of sorts, um, working within the subset of cybersecurity. And then just narrowing down or peeling down that layer is really where we find a lot of the challenge and why we're on the call today. But the level threes are like the tray level folks. I'm speaking to the ones that are in their niche right now. They've got five to 10 years experience, not all together in cybersecurity they could, or five to 10 years within their respective niche. They've been a pen tester for the last 10 years. Or they've been a vulnerability researcher and they moved up to a manager within the last you know, three years. I used to call them trade tricksters because they're the folks when I was recruiting that I would call and they'd be like, yeah, I'll take a call, but you know, I'm, I'm happy right now. So tell me what you got. That's fantastic. But at the same time, um, they would consider themselves a subdramatic expert, but weren't really sometimes. Um, or maybe you're at the peak of your role and you really are a good subdramatic expert. You're probably pushing over to that level four, but you're currently in the process of like, I've been doing this for 10 years and I just want to switch. I'm just, I'm, I'm tired or I'm burnt out or I want to try something different. Those are your level three folks. Um, and then your level four. I love these folks. I currently work with nothing but these folks. Um, and I've been really grateful to be around them. Uh, maybe you're 20, 10, 20 years in the game. You've been there, done it, got the t-shirt, ran through it, came back, throw it back. Um, and then they're the ones who've been the decision makers or are currently on the decision makers. Um, and they're also the ones that are stuck. Maybe they're um, they're wanting to get back to the back to basics approach. So you've got all this experience. You're in your niche right now. You've been the expert level or moved into the expert level within the last 10 years or 11 years or 20 years. Um, but you're kind of like, I'm feeling a little lost. Well, maybe you're going to knock down into a level two or a level three. And you're like, okay, that's cool. I don't know the space. I don't know too much about it, but I've had some networking. What do I do? You're going to get back to basics. And what I mean by this is I've never been a level four in any skill that I've done because I really believe that I don't have enough years experience to do that. Or um, I was pretty close to tapping into that when I was in executive headhunting. Um, but I went from being level three, moving into a level four, many years experience in my job, knew, like, knew it from the inside and out, can walk in, close a deal, do what I needed to do, to going down to a level one. And that was a very different mind shift. And I think when we're talking about finding your niche and finding your specialty, it's a full pulse check of what it is currently that you've done or currently that you want to do. And maybe you're not even in the space to even know what that is. You're just like, I'm just trying to figure it out. Um, but this is a good um, way to kind of look at um, all of this can vary. You can be a level four in certain areas, a level one here, and this can be your skill. It could be your years of experience. It could be, and I just put years of experience to kind of give you that. Um, and it could be your level of knowledge, your level of grasp, your level of flexibility. Use it to how you feel, but it's sort of to just determine where you fit, whether it's in the market or where you, where you can actually get some sort of pulse check to what you're, you're currently in right now um, and how close you can get to finding out where your niche is. So to further, to further in depth, like this, this topic here, I created what's called a skill SWOT analysis. I did this. I'm not um, sure I understand. Apparently Siri doesn't understand. Um, so I did this. Um, Probably, I want to say, sorry, forgive me guys. Um, I did this probably September, October. And because I was about four months into my job and I was like, all right, I got a lot of information. Well, what does this information do for my career? I was very clear. And so um, I broke it. If essentially, if you know what a SWOT analysis is, if you worked um, either on the business side or have just seen it within like a meeting of sorts, 
um, then you know what I'm talking about. It's a method for identifying and analyzing internal strengths and weaknesses within the business and external opportunities and threats that can shape the current or future operations of a business. So this gives it a full 360 pulse check of like where they can gain, where they can go, what, what happens. Well, I was like, that's cool, but I don't like the language of that. And I want to use this to identify like what I can currently figure out what I can bring to the table and then get closer to narrowing down what I want to do so I can specialize in my niche. Um, and so from that side, because I didn't like the language and I wanted it to be catered to me, um, your strengths right here. Strengths of what you what's working for you right now. And that could be your executive gravitas, the way you present yourself. It could be the fact that you can take complex ideas and narrow them down to something very dumb that anyone can understand. Um, or it could be that you're very strong in Linux, you're very strong in coding, you're very strong in um, you know, vulnerability management, you're very strong in, in understanding complex and actually taking it to action. And you don't need a ton of ramp up time. What is your strength currently? Um, and then what is your gap? This is where the weakness would be, but I don't consider this a weakness, but a limit of what you don't know. And essentially you will always have a gap. So let me be very clear. You will not know everything um, because what you don't know, you don't know in the wise words of Maya Angelou. And then here's your game. This is essentially where a threat would be when we're looking at a SWOT analysis, but I thought it was terrible language again. Um, cause what you tell yourself, you believe honestly, um, so be kind. Um, uh, so I changed it to gain. What's the gain in my niche? Like, what am I gaining by narrowing down in the specialty? And what am I gaining from, um, the market and essentially my field by narrowing down this niche? What's my gain? Um, and what skills do I need to narrow down and get closer to it? And then you're built. Your build is where your projects come in, your portfolio, make it make sense where you're continuing education. So if you are cert stacking, cert stacking appropriately. Um, networking, how can I build my focus to get closer to that? And to further, so like for me, a strength would be like tech skill. So I'm in between the stage of like building my tech skill and then also playing to my strengths and what I do know. And then there's a gap here for me, like settling on my niche. And then I gotta get on cert stacking. I gotta get on something. So I can build and fill in some of the gaps here. Most importantly to me personally, my goal is to have a happy balance between gain and strength. I want to be strong in my skill set, strong in my in my skill set, so that I'm as I'm narrowing down into my niche, um, I can maintain that that childlike wonder of learning because I do feel like that's probably a hundred percent of why I'm here today, being able to present and also have the role, the job that I did in the time frame that I did. Um, and again, so having the gain of the not knowing part, because I am a lifelong learner, it's just not a marketing employee for me. It's actually truly what grounds me. And then and again, what I feel like I've gotten here today. And then of course, areas I'm most experienced, there's a gap and a gain for me through networking and uh, where I have the most experience in. There's a lot of gaps. It could be networking more. It could be um, you know having more experience or exposure to the area that I'm wanting to sustain. In, and that's my gain. So there's a lot of ways to look at this, um, but I wanted to have something where I can kind of just like fill in or understand, all right, where am I at? Because it's so overwhelming to be in this position, no matter where you are, if you're a level one, level two, level three, level four, it, it applies no matter what. And it's something that I refer back to consistently over the last couple of months, particularly when I've been slammed with projects. I am doing work that I, I think I was mentioning this to Mike earlier, no business doing at the level that I'm doing, but I appreciate that the, my willingness to try and figure it out is rocking with me enough for me to complete, execute, and succeed in that, and then be given more. And so I really wanted to use my experience currently to, to build my own skill set. And so I've used this while I'm at work to try and figure out, okay, where am I lacking here? What am I not? I have one for work. I have one for my personal home lab. Um, my personal skill set, and I, I rock with between the both of them. And this is evident in um, an action plan. So this is also another example of something realistically, like my goal is to attain appropriate niche understanding, which is to move into the cloud sec um, and start projects in that space by June. So I just roughly map this out. Um, and you can also use this as a roadmap. It could be a two-year plan for 2024, 2025, however that looks like for you. Um, but it's an action plan of how you can build, get into your niche and what your timelines look like so that you are on track and not feeling like you're, you're spinning wheels all the time. 
So for me, I wanted to pick my niche by January. By the end of this month, I was like, we're going to pick an executive decision and I'm already there. Um, by February, I wanted to define what the tech skill I was going to need, what are the upskills I needed technically to learn this, what I needed to put in my home lab, what did I need to learn? What is the market talking about? What's going to make sense? What kind of roles am I looking at? Um, by May, and this has given me time here to just kind of incorporate, obviously, my, my plan for work, downtime for myself, because again, that complexity of easy to difficulty ratio I had to think about, like, realistically, can I sit here for 10 hours a day learning this stuff? No, I got work. And then on the weekends, I'm dog tired. Also, I would like to play my PS4 on occasion. Sue me. Don't, but you know what I mean? <laughs> So from that side, confirm certs, maybe through that research, I'll find out what kind of certs are going to make the most sense for me to take, whether it's um, tech related specific or it's um, skill specific, whatever that looks like for me, and then present portfolio. So through that and through this process, I've decided to take on my own personal project that can not only add to my skill set and my toolbox on a personal level for um, professional gain, obviously, but also help with my company and presenting um, a, a strategy, of, um, presenting a cloud migration strategy to my company, which they don't know about. So everyone hush hush. Um, by June, that's my goal. I wanted to really figure out what I can do with that. And then the rest of the six months to me is just networking, getting out into my field, understanding that more because I'm in a unique position where I can actually say, yeah, I've, I'm in my role right now, but what am I going to do with the experience that I'm gaining? Um, and I do believe that that approach has allowed me to take on role like opportunities and lead and execute and close initiatives as quickly as I have. Um, and also because I played to the strengths that I looked at, which was the fact that I was a project manager, the fact that I have zero shame and telling you I have no clue what the hell this is. Talk to me like I'm stupid. And that has been very successful for me. Um, and so from that end, you know, this is just, again, just if you want to take a snapshot of it, feel free, but just an idea of what I needed to do for myself to feel like I was on course and not spinning my wheels. Cause that to me was just for me that does, I'm not working at my best for that. Um, and the reason why I harp on this too, is when I started in cybersecurity, one of the key, uh, factors, and I'll get into this one here, um, in a second, is that they said, how you do something every day is how you approach an attack. So how do you, how do you, the details of what you do around um, making your bed or how you would approach a problem, it's almost the same a way that you would if there was a threat happening. So I really wanted to drive that into my head, like, how would I do this? Um, and so because of that, I actually interviewed my coworker, who um, I'm fortunate, again, to work on a team of level four guys who came to my company in the last stitch of their careers. So I have just been a sponge absorbing questions and doing things. Um, so I interviewed my coworker, who's a network engineer for our company. My colleague, John, it's not, he's asked to be anonymous, but his name's John. Um, my colleague has over 30 years experience in the field of tech, specifically in networking. Um, he maintains, uh, maintains, builds, and designs our network architecture at our company currently. And we overlap a lot. Um, we work together simultaneously on multiple projects. We're working on three initiatives together right now. Um, I mentioned I was presenting today on the call and he agreed to be interviewed. And so John has led teams of up to 50 for major corporations over his 30 year tenure. And most recently in the last 15 years before moving to my current company, um, he worked for GE. And so he is what I like to consider a level four person. Um, he has been there, done that, and decided to get back to basics by moving to a smaller company and finishing out his career um, with my current my current company. And so from that, um, I wanted to get his insight. I wanted to share something with you guys tonight about someone who has a niche and is a level four um, and what he's done with it and what his advice would be. And so as a former hiring manager um, and fellow tech enthusiast, um, I asked John what made him get into networking and narrowed down his career to that. And, and so here are some of his takeaways. And um, John stated he fell in love, or I should say, he started working in tech in 1994 as just general tech support, plugging in stuff uh, into the routers and cabling and all of that good nature. Um, and so that kind of gradually brought him into to networking. He enjoys building architects and designs, and he enjoys being a part of a team. That's the whole reason he got into networking. Um, I asked John as a hiring manager, what is your advice for professionals looking to narrow down their niche while we're all on the call today um, in their field? And what have you seen been successful in doing so? 
And so he's had a solid understanding of, he, he mentioned having a solid understanding of your experience thus far. So whatever experience you come at the table, no matter what level you're at, make it make sense. What have you done? And what knowledge do you have? Um, he said, having a solid understanding of your experience thus far and making it make sense is the key factor in what would have made him hire someone or give someone a shot. So again, it's open to interpretation on that, but niches and narrowing down your specialty, just know that you're going to be a lifelong learner from that. And he also commented that, which I was very surprised by, he gave me a compliment and he said, I appreciate someone like myself who took this role, my role currently, that was an entry-level role, um, and then turned it around as he's watched me raise my hand for multiple things. And he found out that was really impressive. And he wished that more people who are making that transition into cybersecurity or making the transition into technology in, in general um, would have the guts to do so, no matter what level or age bracket you're in. Um, he also mentioned be very clear when you're narrowing down your niche um, to not pigeonhole yourself. Essentially um, decide if being a manager or teaching um, within that niche, once you decide what it is, is what you want. So for instance, if being a pen tester or working in um, vulnerability management, or if it's app sec, or if it's um, cloud sec, what does that mean? Are you an engineer? Are you an analyst? Are you wanting to be a manager? Uh, are you wanting to move on to more of the developer side? Like what does DevSecOps, great. What do those roles look like? Map that out and don't pigeonhole yourself specifically to just a specific tech stack. It could benefit in the long run, but to be able to have skill sets and understand the mapping of what that looks like for you in your niche, at least within the next five years, is really important. So particularly when he got his networking, he had no interest in being a manager, but because he had so many years experience, that was the next role, essentially, the next step up or the next movement for him within his niche. Um, and so from that, for John, people leading was not his calling. And he also doesn't believe in cert stacking. He's one of the few that he really speaks to experience. And so let your experience or your projects that you're working on really dictate your path. Um, he's an example of someone who, who has had a 30 year career, um, with no certifications or degrees, but he's had a wealth of knowledge. And if he can go back, it's obviously a different landscape now than when he started, but he would go back and say, understand how you want to be. Um, if you feel like you want to grow into being a people leader, make sure you're in the right environment for that. It doesn't necessarily mean it's in your niche, but understand what the different levels of roles within that niche would be. Um, and then finally, I asked John, networking um, is really a niche, but as what we see around, it's it's vague, right? Um, and so what's his advice for getting into a vague niche like networking? Or uh, what background does he look for if anyone wanted to start dipping their toes into the, the networking side of that? Um, and some of you may already have your NetSec or your Net Plus or your Sec Plus. Um, but he said, technically, no Cisco and no Linux well. He also wanted to make the caveat, make sure that when you are learning a tech stack or you're learning, um, you know, like a Linux or Cisco or any of that, make sure that it's transferable to your next role. Because sometimes, again, it goes back to his initial concept. When you pigeonhole yourself, I think that's what's been able to give him the 30-year career is that he's touched Linux, he's done on-prem, he's done cloud, he's done all these things. He's done the development, he's done the architect, he's done the leading. So he's seen it all within networking, which is a very open niche um, and couldn't be narrowed down into certain things also. Um, but I think he's a great example of that, Rod, and I wanted to interview him to be able to to give you that perspective that sometimes it's not like this very specific thing you need to do. Maybe it's just like walking into something and be like, hey, I enjoy networking. Great. What do you enjoy about it? I don't know. I'm going to figure it out. That's okay. That's a that's an area that you're looking into and you're finding your way through that. Um, and so when you define your niche or specialty, or specialty um, keep in mind, it doesn't have to be too specific right off the bat, um, which was something I had to learn and I'm still learning now. Ultimately, it boils down to narrowing down your focus on something that you can become good at and then enjoy in your everyday process. One thing I would also mention, I was humbled by the idea that don't pursue something that I'm already good at because I don't enjoy. I don't enjoy GRC work. It's absolutely necessary. I'm bomb at it. I know I am because I've been told, but also documentation from the beginning, working in project management, making sure everything was connected. That connected a lot to the skill set of why I've been able to write up quickly on that end, but I have zero interest in pursuing that moving forward. Zero. However, working on teams adjacent to that, totally here for it. 
I appreciate the skill set it's given me because now if I'm talking to, you know, a company and I want to bring them on or do a merger and acquisition, you know, any of that stuff, I'm like, give me your, your audit. I want to know what that looks like because I have a little bit of that skill set to look at it from that lens. Um, but again, I reiterate um, what you're good at sometimes may not necessarily be what your specialty is. And there's a very different distinction because you're dedicating time into that. So make sure it's something you want to be good at, something you're interested in that can sustain you for a long period of time. And you can enjoy doing the day-to-days for that because the day-to-days for that may look differently from another, another specialty. Um, and so all that, if you find yourself thinking, well, that's all great, Shannon. Um, how do I even like, that's, this is fantastic. How do I start? This is what I call a growth strategy. Um, it's how you can grow into your niche and to picking it. And this is, again, timeline is obviously up to you, but put yourself on a timeline, um, stick to it. So let's say, and this is just a rough example, in February of 2024, I, by the end of that, I want to narrow down three subsets I enjoy. Let's just boom, pick it. Nothing else, no other rabbit holes, just pick the three that I like. And then spend your time from the end of February to the end of March researching that, mapping networking events that may be relevant to those three subsets. Okay, cool. Um, and then by April, your niche is picked, and then you're going to adjust the rest of your time accordingly. So that's within like a 90 day turnaround period. If anybody's worked out or started a program, they know you got at least 90 days to see a difference from that. So that's a skill you've probably learned or know of. You can apply it here um, and just kind of grow into that. For me, in my case, um, I did that. I initially thought I thought I knew what I wanted, but I'm human. We think we know we want, we you don't. Know. <laughs> At least for me, I didn't at the time. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I was like, this sounds cool. Um, and then I just took a step back and was like, wait a minute, let me just kind of grow into this and see what happens. And then conversation started happening about moving to hybrid, started talking about um, what we have right now and elevating our infrastructure. And I was like, oh, raise my hand, raise my hand, raise my hand, raise my hand. Same thing might be happening if you're in school right now. Same thing might be happening if you're already in the field working on a project and you're like, I actually really like this part. I think I might want to start zeroing in on this and see if I can start switching my current role to more of this. This could be what that is for you. Um, And so from that side, my final all in and here are my top suggestions and narrow down your niche. Number one, do your research. Look at job descriptions. Don't ask your buddies. Just look at companies that you really like, what they're doing from a product or service standpoint um, or what their stack is like, like really they're, they're doing this kind of environment. I really want to be in a great look at that. Um, and then look at the people who are working there or who have a role that you think you may want, um, and start getting interested. Look at their stats. This finding your niche can be a strategic process instead of a half-hearted kind of spinning your wheels. Um, and so a lot of this presentation tonight is to kind of give you more of a structure, more of a thought process, more of a strategic analytical way of being like, okay, what am I really sinking my teeth in? Um, because to me, my time is my currency. And if I'm going to spend it, I'm going to spend it wisely. Um, that's my side. And that may not be different for you. And we'll get to that here in a second. But additionally, as you go through, no matter what level you're in, never underestimate your area of gap and never overestimate your area of gain. Um, and what I mean by that is finding a niche and a specialty focus, you can, you'll can you never be a full expert in anything that you do. But do enough not to just be dangerous, but to sustain that dangerousness. Um, and so do so, it's always changing. So no matter what you do, never underestimate your ability in not knowing something, and then vice versa. I have taken like, we'll see what clicks for me kind of approach with all of the stuff that I don't know, so I can learn what I actually like. And then I can ask those what seems like dumb questions just because I want to understand it more. Um, And by doing that, I've gained way more knowledge um, and excitement than I anticipated. And then I also want to add to that part of adult learning when we are specializing, when we are trying to really become more focused into an area, when it's in our career, there's a lot of noise around. Um, But what I've learned in, in working in this space thus far and being in this space is you'll never stop learning. So part of adult learning, when I actually taught that course, because I did teach adult learners, the huge challenge was that um, we forgot how to learn. We forgot how to ask questions. We, what do you think your niche is right now? And then learning that special, because at the end of the day, a niche is a specialty, right? So um, my other advice to that too, is if you've been sitting on something that kind of interests you for more than about three months, and you've gone down a few little rabbit holes, you might've already found it. Sink your teeth in it, take the plunge 
go into the growth strategy, however it is, but sit with it. Um, and then number two, <clears throat> one thing that I underestimated was how much I needed to consider my lifestyle. And what I mean by that is if your motivation is money, it's a monetary factor, by all means, create the roadmap that I showed early on the slides and go for it. But do your research on salary, do your research and don't just ask your buddies. And what I mean by that is the years of experience in job descriptions or the years of experience you see people that are doing the things that you're doing that you want to do may not necessarily look like that for your journey. If you see what my journey looked like, vastly different, completely out of the box, could be considered a one-off or not. Um, but that was my journey and yours is going to look very different. So don't compare um, when that happens, but also understand if that money is what you're searching for, what do you need to do and what level of skill and to what degree of level of skill in that specialty do you need to focus on? And so all the other things I showed earlier in the presentation tonight, utilize that to kind of narrow that down for you if you've already got that picked out. Number two, time away from family. It's time dedicated to a craft. So think about the time away from your family and friends, yourself. If you're going in for certs, if you're studying, if you are narrowing down a niche, it's essential so use the growth mindset to get you closer to making an executive decision on what your niche is. Put a timeline on that, baby, because you don't have time to waste. Um, when I graduated with my MBA, I thought I was done learning. I thought I would never have to use an Excel sheet. I could, I could laugh and bury myself right now with how much that is so untrue. And I'm almost burnt out from having to do all the learning and the overwhelming aspect of that. But at the same time, I chose it because I wanted to make an executive decision about specializing in a certain area and particularly in cybersecurity. And so because of that, I've had to do these things to strategically put myself on a roadmap and take the time I think I need to not only retain that information, to find out the research I need to, to narrow that down. And then the timeline it's going to take me to make that executive decision and be comfortable with it. And then finally, as I mentioned, think of your easy to difficult ratio. Um, when considering a niche, how much mental bandwidth do you have to take this on? What interests you? What doesn't? The worst thing you can do is be realistic because when you're spinning your wheels, you don't really, you're not being realistic. You're just spinning wheels. And so the best thing you can do is to commit to a timeline at the bare minimum You say, by this time, this is just what I'm going to do and make an informed executive decision about that. And then what your niche is. Um, and then some of the, hopefully tonight's presentation can help you navigate how you'll get there. Um, but on an all end, really understand the, the easy to difficult milestones on that. Because for me, I would love to get into digital forensics. I don't have the bandwidth and I sure stuff do not have the lifetime or the, the time span. It needs to really be at that level that I want to be if I was to go into that area um, because I just don't have it. <laughs> And so really consider your life. So if you had asked me like five years ago, sign me up FBI, you know, but now not so much. So things have changed. So really consider where you are right now and consider what's comfortable for you and go with that. So um, for now, that's, you know, that's what I have for tonight. I'll open it for Q&A. Please enter the chat. Don't be shy. And thank you all for listening and, and watch me carry on from here. Mm -hmm.